Welcome, everyone, to episode 72 of the Single Malt Strategy Podcast. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, the Historical Gamer, also known as Matthew. Hi, Matt. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Tortuga Power, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. They know They know who I am, right? I yeah, think. I would hope so by now. <laughs> so, And today we are joined by none other than Das Tactic. People can just speculate on why we might be bringing him in. Um, how are you doing, Das? <laughs> G'day, guys. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to this. It should be fun. Just to let you know, Das, you can call me Eric and you can call THG Matt. We go by our first names for this one. My kids actually call me Daz. <laughs> that's that's funny. <laughs> yeah, they always have. It's sort of funny. It's, it's been a, it's, so Daz has always been my nickname, like ever since I was a little kid, actually. So it's sort of funny that uh, my actual kids... Uh, like I'm actually uh, ex- an expected grandparent uh, coming up actually uh, towards the latter end of this year. And um, even that, they're thinking of uh, having me named as Granddaz. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have anything like that. But when I was in high school, it was like the middle of the poker craze or whatever. And uh, for some reason, I got the nickname Diesel, which I'm pretty sure was derogatory in somehow in some way. But I never figured it out. <laughs> and I actually have like some of my best friends, like my best friend's wife knew me for like a year as diesel before she even really knew my name <laughs> well i was speaking of nicknames this is funny the reason why i am tortuga power is because people call me tortuga when i was in spain so that's where the origin of my name is oh really yeah yeah when i was living in spain i uh, so spanish people have this kind of stereotype that they show up late for places and then I was named Tortuga, so I, I mean, you might be able to put two and two together here. I was actually later than they were, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of amazed them because they were used to punctual Americans. And then now me, I was very laid back about arriving on time. So I should name some of my bosses or coworkers Tortugas. I have since changed, by the way. I'm, <laughs> I'm now very punctual, but I, I admit that back then I wasn't. Uh, now, let me step back for a second. We should actually properly introduce Das. Das Tactic, uh, you can introduce yourself, but let me just set the stage. You are a content creator, big YouTube channel, and also you kind of, I think, predominantly switched to Twitch now. Um, and you do a lot of the same kind of strategy games that, that I do. At least I know that I know about you because you were always playing the games that I ended up buying. I was once like the person who watched Das Tactic and then bought the games that he was playing. So anyways, but take it away from there. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about. I still try to focus predominantly on YouTube uh, as far as the actual content is concerned. It's certainly the one that sort of sticks in my mind is trying to sort of do the content. Um, Twitch, I tend to like simply because I it's a nice way to connect with the audience. Um, like So I do actually enjoy that a lot. Uh, it, it's not... It's not as um, like it's not a really good business decision to go to Twitch, I guess. Uh, that certainly hasn't sort of like YouTube is still the the main income that I actually have. Uh, but I'm trying to grow Twitch. So Twitch is sort of one of those things where it's only a, it's only a small fraction of what I get from YouTube, which is still not a great amount. But anyway, <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, it's sort of it's and I, I try to keep it as a hobby. I try to keep all of this as a hobby because as soon as I start to get it so that it's working um, as a business, then I, I know I won't enjoy it as much. I've tried that in the past and it's just, so I try not to look at analytics too much. I try not to worry about analytics much at all. I'm exactly the same way. Matt, I'm just asking, do you, is that more or less your experience? Do you find that Twitch is not the way to go forward for business? Because I've actually seen a lot of people switching to Twitch and they've been saying that Twitch is the way forward. You want to make a living. Maybe that's not true. Uh, when is it, you know, I've I feel like my channel's been around for what 10 years. We've all been doing this for a long time. I feel like when everything, when I was getting started, YouTube was the place to be. Then they did all these, you know, DMCA policies and whatnot. People got pissed off. They went to Twitch and then Twitch decided to do a bunch of you know, similar questionable policies. And now everybody's saying, oh, Twitch is dying and it's not where the live streaming is going to be in the future. And YouTube's doing all these great things. It seems like it's a circle, you know, people, people move from one to the other, but I will agree with Das that, uh, if you're looking at, you know, making this a business, which I definitely, mine is, it's a hobby. Uh, it's nowhere near uh, a business. I don't think I would want it to be either. I, to, to your point, I think, I don't think I would enjoy it as much if it was a full-time job. But, um, if you're just looking at the analytics and, and the money side of things, I think YouTube is definitely, at least for a channel my size, uh, is, is is considerably more viable uh, than Twitch is. Uh, you, you guys are almost the same as far as subscriber count goes. I think you're both at around 50,000. So you, you are 
a pretty similar comparison. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, because um, yeah, I've sort of found that the um, exactly what Matt's saying there. You know, like it really is a um, an aspect where Twitch is fun, and that's why I do it. Um, I wouldn't do it if it was uh, just purely financial. It's sort of it's a more of a for me. It is just literally that connection. I found that when I was live streaming so much, I was doing as much live streaming on YouTube at one stage. And I found that was killing my channel because it killed the uh, the algorithm. So I stopped I stopped live streaming to a large degree on YouTube. I still would like to do a bit more than what I do on YouTube with live streaming, but it's uh, maybe once a week would be great. But um, you know, you tend to end up get, then getting a like a regular audience on on Twitch, and so you head across there. Just but it's just not economically viable. It's just more of a fun aspect. Yeah, I actually found myself moving over to Twitch from YouTube for live streaming. I don't know three four years ago. It was I would say for me it was driven by two. Two things. One, my numbers in terms of viewers were always higher on YouTube, but it did seem like it was impacting, you know, the the regular videos in terms of their performance. But also it felt it felt like YouTube's viewership was much more hollow. Like there wasn't anywhere near as much engagement. I would have to double to three times as many people watching on, on YouTube, but the amount of people watching on Twitch were much more vocal and much more engaging. It was just more fun to be on Twitch. I actually didn't find that. I found the almost the opposite, actually. I get a lot more comments um, when I actually do stream on YouTube. Even now, like even when I go back to... I, do, I really do enjoy streaming on YouTube, but it just I found that just by doing the live streams, it really did kill the algorithm. And so my, my regular, what you were saying before, the regular videos suffer for it. And um, I prefer to put more effort into the actual Let's Plays and the actual uh, the series that I can put onto YouTube in that sort of sense, rather than just doing it as a live stream. So it was a hard decision to make. But in the end, I sort of thought, look, it's better to try to at least have YouTube sort of specialised for that sort of content and then have Twitch, which is more of a, a streaming platform. Yeah, it's sort of, it's funny. It was sort of like one of those things I would have, I would have loved to have been able to just stream on YouTube, to be honest. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I, I had two other reasons. One is YouTube at the time, anyway, I have no idea where it is now, like, not that I'm making a business out of it, but if you look at the financials, like YouTube streaming was just, we made the comment that YouTube is where, where it makes more sense from like a financial perspective, but that's definitely in my experience on the, the VODs or the video on demand. Um, YouTube streaming was like, just you were getting pennies uh, on the dollar compared to what you would get on Twitch for a smaller audience. Um, but then really, I think the other piece for Twitch was just, I was trying to diversify. It was around the time where like, the ad apocalypse is, was happening and there was all this, you know, questioning of, of YouTube and their policies. And I just thought, you know, as, as a creator who's, who's enjoying playing games and sharing things with people, it one, there's a benefit to, to splitting the content where you've got sort of sit down and watch versus, you know, stream, um, having them in two different places because they're really two different products made sense. But then also just not having everything beholden to the whims of Google or Twitch, having a little bit of diversity in, in your output and building communities across the two sites was also something I was interested in. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that's a, it's a good point. It's, um, and it, 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 they are largely different audiences as well. Like, you know, the, the people that tend to watch your YouTube content very rarely go to Twitch. And um, that's also why I do I do mean to keep on coming back and doing a bit of streaming on, on YouTube. But um as I say, it really it killed my um, killed my site, my YouTube site. Like the actual the drop in numbers from like a few years ago uh, when I started doing the live streams on YouTube, it just absolutely tanked. <laughs> I think it probably looks at like the percentage of video watched. So if someone drops in on like a two hour stream for like twenty minutes, that hurts you as opposed to if they watch like ten minutes instead of a thirty minute, you know standard video the percentage there is higher so engagement is considered better i, I would guess that's a piece of it well, you're, you're not supposed to talk about the algorithm oh you're not so that's the first rule about youtube <laughs> you don't talk about the algorithm. whatever i'm guessing i have no inside information we just so. praise it we we just we we adore it from a distance and we <laughs> we smile graciously when it shines light upon us but don't question the algorithm sounds a little spiritual yeah well that's what i was going for but <laughs> uh, well, let, let's shift topics actually to the games we're playing lately um because i know that there's one game at least that das and i have both been playing i can't wait to get his opinion on it um but i want to start with matt matt what have you been playing um well you know the usual stuff uh war in the pacific and whatnot but i don't need to talk about that because it's the same every week 
I would say the the big thing that's different for me is probably a platform I've never talked about on this uh, podcast before, and I that is uh, I'm playing Triangle Strategy, which is a game that's made by Square Enix, and it is uh, exclusively available on the Nintendo Switch. This is crazy, by the way. I don't want to cut you off, but I only heard about, for the first time today, Triangle Strategy. And I just looked it up probably two or three hours ago and watched a two-minute gameplay video. So it's just weird that you just said that. It's it's really interesting. So Triangle Strategy is, first off, I think the name is pretty bad. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what it means, and I don't know that anybody who hears the name is going to know what it means. So maybe that's that's a good thing. Um, but it is a, how do I describe it? Like it's a, it's a strategy game where you're basically in charge of a house in a kingdom. So there's sort of three high houses in this kingdom, uh, and there's three kingdoms on this map. And so you're sort of in this era of peace, uh, following a major series of wars. And so you're like the warrior clan in this kingdom of yours, um, and, it, you know, the best way to, I think, to describe it is it's kind of like Game of thrones like internal court politics is is sort of ruling, r- ruling what's going on here. And so there's all these different, there's conflicting houses within your kingdom. There's the three kingdoms that are all sort of vying for power. Uh, it's a strategy game in the sense that the game is heavily narrative focused. There is a lot of downtime, like you find yourself clicking through entire segments where you're not doing anything other than reading dialogue and sort of watching things happen. But then when when a battle occurs, you fight it in kind of a turn based, almost like a Final Fantasy tactics style battlefield where you've got your different units that you carry forward from battle to battle. They gain experience. They can get perks. You can upgrade their equipment and then you fight against various opponents through the game. It's kind of like a choose your own adventure novel to an extent, like you go through all these dialogue scenes and you have to make some key decisions that influence the story. Um, and then as the story comes to, to battles, then you get to fight those battles in the tactical scene. It is a very slow paced game. Um, I found myself kind of really shocked by how slow parts of the game are, where it's like you're going through five or different five or different six different scenes where there's really no input for you other than just to sort of like read what's going on. And then eventually you get to a point where you have to make a decision or you have to fight a battle. Despite that, I find myself really enjoying it. I think the story is compelling use a pixel art style which is kind of feels very retro i could imagine it would be something that you would like think of when you're thinking of like the nintendo uh game boy advanced or like um nintendo ds back in the day but i really am i'm i've put i think 16 hours into it over the last three days uh two days ago i was up to like three in the morning playing the thing realizing like this is not good i i haven't been playing i haven't played a game like this this I haven't been in, as engrossed in a game like this. I'm trying to think of the last time, maybe like the last time I could ex- I could sort of find myself falling into a game like that is probably like when Skyrim came out. Wow, it's, it's so you rate it that that highly? Yeah, I mean, I really like it. Uh, you know, to each their own. Like I said, I, I my my warning to anyone would be it is very slow paced. So be ready for wait. I just clicked through five dialogue sequences in the scene, and I had nothing. Yeah, you know, I didn't get to do anything. But I think it's it's trading on sort of that. Uh, again, I, I don't, I don't, I know, don't know how to describe it better than like, it kind of feels like it's trying to be a little bit of games, game of Thrones is where you're seeing different characters and whatnot interact and respond to different situations. And you're trying to gauge what's really going on. Is there a, um, a large procedural content or is there sort of like randomization? Like, like does each playthrough feel the same or does it feel quite different? I'm still on my first playthrough. Uh, I believe I'm about halfway through it cause I'm on like chapter 10 and I think it says there's about 19 to 20 chapters. So I don't know exactly how replayable it is, but I can definitely tell you like there's these different sc- scenes where they call they call it the scales of conviction where you basically have to go around your, your parties uh, in your in your sort of entourage and you have to try and convince them to go with the decision that you want to go with. Is it like the old board game Diplomacy? Have, did you guys ever play that? I wouldn't say it's like Diplomacy. I'm familiar with that, but it's, it's much more like the, the comparison that everybody uses and I never played it. Um, So it's hard for me to say, but is Final Fantasy Tactics. But no, I wouldn't say it's like diplomacy. Essentially, there's just these scenes where you kind of talk to your entourage and try and convince them to side with you or or to pick your decision. And then based on your decision, these scales of conviction, you go either one direction or the other, and that influences the story. 
I know there's one really big point where you either go to one kingdom or, or a completely different kingdom. So that's going to drive a completely different experience in terms of the scenes and what happens there. I, I believe there's like seven or eight different potential endings. So I think there's a fair bit of diversity in um, in in the gameplay, but I, I assume there are some some pretty hard coded events as well, which I don't want to give away spoilers or anything like that. But there's definitely some things that are going to happen no matter what. And I think um, there's a fair bit of, of items where, based on your choices, uh, you, you have completely different outcomes. Right. Sounds interesting. It'd be sort of, it's one of those things, I think, if it did actually have, if it had a high randomization content to it, I think it's something that sounds, for me, it would take to really sort of tick a lot of my boxes. Yeah, I don't think it's, I, w- I wouldn't call it random, right? Like, I assume it's sort of, a, based on your decision, there's a set outcome based on your decision in given points. But there's enough decisions that you're going to get seven or eight, or, or I believe I saw eight or nine is sort of the answer on the number of potential like outcomes at the end so there's going to be a fair amount of replayability and i think the campaign's definitely going to take me at least 30 hours or not campaign but the game's going to take me at least 30 hours to get through my first playthrough so you know to me if i can get 30 hours my first playthrough and there's potentially you know three or four interesting ways to replay it without it feeling too carbon copy like i think that's well worth worth the time in, into a game like that yeah when you consider what a movie costs to go and see you know like it's um like often people make that comparison don't they really like if it's if you're playing a game for you know 10 times the length of time that you see a movie and it costs about the same then you know it's all good stuff yeah or i mean and i'm just being honest like in terms of the amount of games that i've played more than 100 hours of of time into the list is pretty small you know you got games probably like gary grigsby's uh distant world or gary grigsby's war in the pacific distant worlds uh, paradox stuff like ck or something like that but the list of games that you're going to put that that amount of hours into, at least for me, is pretty small. So I, I think anyway, for me, it's it's definitely worth worth a look. Yeah, yeah. You know what I found it kind of similar to, although much higher production value and much more. You have a lot more input on what happens because you actually fight the tactical battles. But it kind of reminds me of Yes, Your Grace. I don't know if either of you played that game. That was a PC game that came out a couple of years ago. I did see it, but I, I never actually played it. Yeah. I mean, it's a similar kind of concept like court intrigue and, and whatnot, and you're running this kingdom. And I really enjoyed that as well. Similar kind of pixel art graphic style and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's what I've been playing. What about you guys? I've got a few unusual ones that you probably aren't expecting me to sort of say. Uh, one that I've been playing a game every single day for the last probably month or so. And it started off with just my wife and I playing it. And it's now our whole family plays it. Like uh, my sister, um, her kids play it, my kids play it, we all play it. it it's just Wordle. <laughs> Do you guys play that at all? No, I have not. Yeah, it's five letters, basically. It's on, on like the Times, uh, to, uh, what is it, the New York Times website now. And it's just a, like it takes about five minutes to play. And it's just brilliant. It's just a, um, and it's sort of fun sharing it. We just do it, we just share it on Messenger, the results. And uh, yeah, it's sort of funny. That's probably, when I think about the difference of the games, that's an unusual one, I guess, is uh, Wordle. And that's, that is that is good fun. It's just um, I don't know why, but yeah, nearly our ho- my whole family actually enjoys playing that one. Um, I'm nowhere near as good as uh, as a lot of the other people in the family. So. so I don't really even know anything about it. Can you summarize what it is? Yeah, just if you go to the, uh, if you just Google Wordle, it'll come up with uh, six rows where you've got to then make a guess. It's a little bit like Mastermind. And um, so when you put the, you've got to put real words in. And so you've got like, I've got standard starting words, essentially, where you sort of put it in, it'll then tell you like, if it's if it's colored gray it means that the letter didn't appear at all in the in the actual word that you're supposed to be trying to guess if it comes up i think it's yellow or orange it means that the word the letter exists in the word but it's in the wrong position and if it comes up green it's the correct letter in the correct position and so just through a, a bit of um of sort of you know trial and error you've got, got to try to sort of narrow it down and get it within the six but you try to do it as fast as you possibly can so they reckon a pass score is to is to be able to guess it in four and and sort of move on from there really but uh, like so if you get it in three if you, you, it's incredibly good if you can get it in two that's just amazing so uh, yeah it's sort of it's a it's a fun little game anyway it's just it's that's one that i've been literally playing every day as soon as i wake up actually before i start streaming it's uh, quickly quickly play that day's uh, wordle and then share it in the um share the results because even the results don't show the res- the actual word they just show the colors as to how you went <laughs> and um we found out this week that my one of my daughters has actually been waiting till everybody has their go she knows what everybody's start word is we didn't even think of this and so she's then 
she's been analysing the colours based on start words and uh, getting it within two or three each time. <laughs> it was funny. So that's just a little one I've been playing. But I've also been playing like some unusual ones like there's a game that's just come out it's a free steam game called fps game dev test like it's a first person shooter test that's quite good fun i'm going to be making a video about that one it's literally just got like all sorts of different first person shooter sort of style and i, I haven't played a first person shooter for such a long time so i find those sort of games fairly relaxing that one does look like good fun um as i say just a free game from steam but i guess the main ones i've been playing of course distant worlds which i guess we'll be talking about collectively but um heroes hour i've been playing a bit of that which has just come out this week or last week I forget which probably la the end of last week I think it came out and that was the game that I wasn't going to cover because it seemed very unstable and um, right up until the, into the day of launch and then I did test it on launch day to sort of see what the stability was like and it, it en ended up going from a very unstable game to being a very very good stable game and I don't know if you guys have seen that at all have you seen Heroes Hour? I have seen it I actually have seen your videos on it as well but the one thing that struck me as remarkable I, I hope I'm not getting this wrong but I think the dev posted a picture of it being number four on the Steam's um, purchase list the number four oh yeah most popular game for like a week which is really mind-blowing if it's true based on the comments that i've sort of seen people leave i would think that that could be you know how you sort of get like a, a percentage of people who really don't understand what the games like games are about so they tend to sort of write things to where you can tell that they're not really interested in the actual game itself if that makes sense and I did notice there was a lot of those sort of comments, but there hasn't been dramatic number of comments on the Steam forum. You know, it's not it's not like there's hundreds of comments every day. There's only be sort of like maybe in the tens of comments. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's but it's a it's a really really cool little game. It's uh, based on Heroes of Might and Magic. It's almost some people are criticising it as being too much like Heroes of Might and Magic, the older versions like version three and version four. Um, it's got a pixel art sort of approach to it. You've got eleven playable factions. Um, there's very high randomization to the actual game itself. Uh, the actual map generation is really, really interesting. You can either design your own map and colour it all in and sort of put all the pieces down so you've actually got like a, a fully fully um, planned map or you can actually uh, build these nodes where it randomises the maps for you based on this sort of node. Very, very simple to put it together. And um, so I was really taken back by just how adaptable the game actually was and the amount of content that it had in it as well was very very good so I've been really enjoying that game um, that's actually one that was as I say I was very interested in, in the approach of the game but I was really concerned about the stability of the game so I wasn't going to recommend it until I actually got the launch version and then it was like wow okay this is actually a really really good game so um, yeah that's one that I would recommend if you did like anyone who liked uh, Heroes of Might and Magic will enjoy that one. From memory it doesn't rate all that highly like people have actually been down rating it a little bit on steam and i'm not sure why um i've been enjoying it a lot <laughs> i'll just mention that i when i saw that it looks a little bit slow i don't know how to say this because i don't mind slow gameplay but there seems to be something almost like boring about it i don't know how to say that yeah i know what you mean like it, it's one of those things where there's not enough i hope that they keep on developing it because there's not enough strategic input into the actual battles like you don't really have a lot of um, of uh, input with them, so and it, they, they tend to get away from you because it's all the battles are actually real time, and you've got so you've got very limited aspects you can do other than sort of maybe cast some spells or something like that. So I really hope that they actually add more strategic elements to the actual gameplay itself to the to the battle component. I think that's one of the things where you don't become attached to your forces, you don't really get a feel for them because it's just like a random all in brawl uh, when you actually do have a battle, and that's that's a negative about the game. The other thing I think with it is as well that it's one of those games that if you if you get ahead of the other players or if someone gets ahead of you it snowballs and that's a problem as well there's no real limits uh, if you can if you can take a second castle it means you've got double the resources double the production double the power and there's no real coming back from that unless you can take that fr back from them fairly quickly so it's got those sorts of issues i guess and so you know i hope that they can address those over time but yeah i, know, I, I do know what you mean like, there's no emotional attachment to the to the characters or to the to the units that you actually have you don't have an instinctive understanding as to what they do would that summarize what you what you're getting at one of the things is on the strategic level it seems pretty simple let's contrast it with the game we'll be talking about a little bit later on distant worlds 2 there's there's so much depth and i i generally prefer those deeper games spoiler alert oh das already spoiled oh <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not really a spoiler by the way we don't care you can obfuscate my uh my my voice <laughs> Well, it is in the title, so... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I really can't put a clear finger on it. I would like to, I'd have to sit back and really analyze why it is I feel it's slow, but um, it just it just seems like there's, uh, and maybe if I played it, it'd be different, but just from the footage I've seen, the pace is a little bit too slow for me, so I, maybe I wouldn't enjoy your game either, Matt, because you said that was slow-paced. But the thing is, I actually enjoy slow-paced games. The games when I can, turn-based games, I'll play them very slowly, very methodically. But usually I enjoy like a lot of analysis and like what can you do and all that. And maybe that one kind of seemed like it's a, you're going to go here and do this and you have one unit that you're more or less controlling your hero. No, you're right, actually. It's, it is a, it's a, um, it's a stack of doom game. Basically, you, you get rewarded for having stacks of doom. So you're going around with as big, a, big an army as you can possibly get. And it's just an all-in brawl. So you don't, there's no real feeling of nuance about the uh, the units that you have. It's just, what can I afford? Throw them all in, let them have their brawl and go from there. And hopefully there'll come a point where there will be nuance to, you know, having certain units protect other units or doing th- like, somebody on one of the streams actually had mentioned that for them it was a combination of Heroes of Might and Magic along with Dominions, but uh, like a Oh, I was going to say, you stole my thunder. I was going to say, this game is like, you can compare it very easily with Dominions. And to me, like Dominions is just clearly the superior game, even though the pacing of that one might even be slower in some, because, you know, it takes a long time to go through your turns and all your different armies on every different territory. But everything, everything matters in Dominions, whereas it, everything doesn't matter in um, Heroes Hour. Yeah, exactly. Th- this could be it. Going back to triangle strategy, I don't think, I think it would be a very different experience because I, I kind of glossed over the, the turn-based tactical battles, but... Essentially, you have a certain number of units you can carry into the battle, but your your entourage is much larger than that. So you're generally going to want to pick and choose the right classes based on either the opponent you're fighting, because I've noticed it seems like the, the different kingdoms have different strengths in their soldiers, or the maps that you're fighting on. Um, you know, if you've got a lot of elevation, archers might be better. Uh, if you're facing overwhelming numbers, you might want to make sure you've got some healers, you know, there as well. So, like, there's a whole bunch of different types of classes, healers, archers, swordsmen, cavalry, mounted archers, um, and then you've got to kind of mix and match who you want to actually bring into the battlefield, and then the terrain matters a lot, too, uh, for your fighting. So, it's there's definitely no stack of doom and triangle strategy. It's very much tactical. Mm, that's good. That sounds interesting because that, that is one of the big problems with Heroes Hour. It is just it's you're just building a stack of doom and um, and then trying to take over as much as you can with that stack. Yeah, the early battles were pretty easy in triangle, but the one I just fought in, in about the halfway point was very difficult, and I actually had to fight it a couple of times to get through it. Anyway, I didn't mean to derail you guys on your games. The only other game, actually, uh, Tortuga was just mentioning before, was uh, Diplomacy is Not an Option. I, I only really covered it, but I didn't really get back into it much. So it's a game that looks really, really interesting, and I do want to play more with that game, but I didn't actually cover it. I didn't really play it a lot other than recording it. Can you, like, what is, what's the deal with that game? Because I saw it and I'm, I, I figured, okay, is this just like a stronghold, like, tower defense game? Or, like, what's... I mean, the ba- the best comparison... Unfortunately, if you haven't played this, it won't matter. But it is essentially they are billions in the medieval time period. It's it's a, it's stronghold with they are billions mechanics. That's the best analogy. Analogy I think is it's they are billions because you've essentially got hordes that come at you, and uh, and you've got to got to clear the map. Like you know, if you, have you played they are billions, uh, Matt? No, I have not actually. I've seen it though. I'm familiar with it. So it's it's very similar. You can sort of set up like uh, patrols for your for your characters. Um, it is a tower defense in the, in the sense that you are trying to build up defensive areas, which is quite good fun. Like trying to sort of build walls and and, uh, and you know, guard towers, put archers in the towers, uh, have foot soldiers as well, ready to sort of do different things, and then actually have small groups that will then be able to quickly go out and try to uncover as much of the map as possible before the next uh, before the next attack occurs. So it's it's a it's a sort of for me it's much better than Stronghold. I I actually didn't really ever since Stronghold Crusader I've sort of felt that that is the scale of that game has not really left me excited I guess. And this game does scratch that Stronghold itch, but in a in a way that they are billions. The mechanics sort of works the same way. So I actually really did enjoy it. I really only played the first two Strongholds, which I enjoyed a lot at the time years and years ago. But I, I know they came out with a new one recently. But I. I I think I dabbled in it. It was kind of like this scale feels really, really small and weird. With Stronghold, I just sort of I find it sort of the opposite. It's almost like like I used to like the small scale sprite maps, uh, sprite units. You know where they were just sort of you only had like the cardinal points at uh, and at forty fives as well, and then they were just you know you would just send them in to do their thing. It was more relaxing than the more recent ones. I find. 
Well, they are billions and diplomacy is not an option. Um, our two games have made me realize how much I love this uh, intertwining of like city. It's almost like a castle builder, really, is what I would call it, which is basically what Stronghold was. But with the tower defense, like horde mechanics, first of all, I want to say this is like a shout out to They Are Billions. I think They Are Billions is maybe one of the best games. It would be in my top 10, top 10 games that came out in the last decade. Wow, that's big. It'd be like, I think the Mona Lisa is very impressive piece of art, even if I'm not going to look at it all the time. I really appreciate They Are Billions as like a masterpiece of game design and the innovation on like their steampunk. Steampunk is not like a new thing. They didn't invent it, but their whole take on that, the world building or world creation from a creativity standpoint, I think it's brilliant. I think that everything about that game is, it holds itself together very well. I don't, I, it was in early access for a really long time. So I don't even remember how it started, but at least the finished product, I think it's a, a whole package that's it's got the whole thing it's got a good art direction it's got really good game design for a person like me who likes castle building it's got the campaign but it's also got the the endless you know the random generated maps i think it's almost the perfect game if you're a person who likes that kind of game so yeah i have, I have really high words of praise for their billions and it's kind of funny because it's something i've i played their billions for i looked at steam before this um like 200 hours so that's a long time. But the campaign takes a long time to go through. It's compelling enough to that I actually wanted to go all the way through it. So I, I really like these kind of games. But now diplomacy is not an option. It's, it's funny. I'm going to juxtapose these for a moment. I think that diplomacy is not an option is a, it's a much simpler game from a creativity standpoint. It's kind of just stealing. I don't want to say stealing because it's not like there's something to innovate here. But it's it's just using the same kind of time frame that stronghold was from it's basically like the stronghold type assets but i i still like that setting more than i enjoy the steampunk zombie one so even though i think diplomacy is not an option is a worse game i enjoy it more that's interesting i'm just trying to find how how many hours i've played <laughs> uh you know, they, they are billions but i don't think it's I, I would be surprised if i've played 10 hours to be honest i feel like they are billions and frostpunk to me or just two games that came out around the same time i think that i just i heard rave things about but just never really got into for whatever reason i i own them both i just never made time for them i'm the same actually i'm the, I, I i did play a fair bit of uh, they are billions or a fair bit I'm, I'm actually now down to eight hours and i still haven't found it <laughs> <laughs> oh no but uh, frostpunk was another one that i wanted to i wanted to cover just never did well i just i i don't know for me i love building up it's i'm true to my name i love the the turtling type defense but i don't i i like tower defense games um some of the, like the traditional ones like plans for zombies or what's that one with the really cool voiceover from the robot but those are traditional tower defense games where you have like specific spots where you can build a tower you don't build the road the road the path is predetermined you know the very traditional tower defense i find that those are interesting but i find it so much better when you can when you're on the map, like there are billions and like diplomacy is not an option and you can create your own walls and towers and all this just wherever and you're doing the resource gathering so it has that Starcraft element to it where it's the real time strategy, resource collection, management of how many thing how many people you're gonna build and all that. So it just it it basically ticks every single one of my boxes. And it's just funny that I'm only kind of realizing this now. But it's, it's just really enjoyable for me. It's not like the only game I would, if I had this, like, what could you take to a deserted island type thing? I wouldn't take only this genre of game. Even though I appreciate it so much, it's also easy for me to burn out on them. And I'd want to switch to other things. But I really do like the genre. And these, those are two games, I think they, they're both really good. So it'd be a recommendation for anyone who hasn't seen Diplomacy is not an option to maybe go check out what it is. Yeah, I have to take a look. I don't play a ton of tower defense games. I, for whatever reason, I've always wanted to really hawk and be like a big proponent of Frostpunk, but I barely played it. And that's like its own, I feel like that's a tower defense game where you're fighting against the environment, not zombies. But yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to take a look into those. Yeah, I, I think tower defense is not really the right term, to be honest. Like tower defense is, um, you've got much more, it's much more open 
It is it is a city builder, and um, it's like you wouldn't really call they are billions a tower defence either. It, it is a it's a horde defence, but it's not really a tower defence, and so that could be misleading, sort of thinking of it in those sort of terms. Actually, I've got six hours down for they are billions. <laughs> the way I call it is a castle builder, but basically it's the same idea as stronghold, but with the the horde waves. Stronghold, the original ones had waves, like you would build the city, and then like waves would come, and then you would build. But then anyway, yeah, it feels it feels more like the original uh, stronghold. Actually, one thing that I, I haven't really played much with the um, uh, with that game essentially was the uh, like with uh, diplomacy is not, not an option. I I did something different at the back end of one of the. Uh, campaigns and then it switched and so you then became essentially in charge of the horde and um, and then it was the enemy armies were were actually coming against you and so you still had to build a, a town to defend against actual knights have you done as much of that eric no i i know the option you're talking about you have an opportunity to choose to go with the king or to stay to stay with the or to stay with the king or to go with the peasant rabble but because i know the peasant rabble one is harder uh, i'm still on my first campaign playthrough so I decided to take the, the conservative approach. Yeah, I didn't go forward. I, I recorded up until that point and then uh, stopped stopped at that point. So I sort of thought that was a good place to sort of leave the recordings. You guys are going to like this. The other game I've been playing, like a lot of, is... Well, by the way, I've been playing Diplomacy as not an option. I've also been playing Their Billions lately because I, I really wanted to go back and even compare the two games. I've been on a real castle builder kick lately. But yeah, the other... How did you find that? Because uh, just from a, almost like a scientific perspective, I, I think it's a, always interesting to go back and look at games that you know have come out a few years ago and just really sort of see if it's your you know f- f- sort of uh, rose-coloured glasses from that from that game is kicking in or whether it really is exceptional. How did you find that process? That would that be quite interesting. Well, it's, that's from that is where I drew a lot of these pretty lofty claims that wow, they are billions is such a great game. This the smoothness of all the interactions, there's the interface, there's just this feel to it. And and the the environment they're trying to set, which is a pretty dark one, they just nail it. I, I just basically everything about that game I think is extremely well done. The comparison, I mean, it, it left me wanting in one sense because uh, the diploma, it made me realize that the game I probably prefer to play because I like the kind of goofy, I love the humor in Diplomacy is not an option. It's got this, this great humor. I, have you seen in the settings, they have the diplomacy as an option in the settings? <laughs> and you can only set it to is not an option, no or off. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it's I mean, they have that kind of sprinkled in through the whole game, too. Like, the all the campaign writing is tongue-in-cheek, I think. Uh, but I think the experience was interesting. It, just to compare the games, it was very helpful because it did make me remember exactly what their Billions was like. And it, I thought the, the light really shone more favorably towards their Billions, but I will probably be playing Diplomacy is not an option going forward. So the the other game I've been playing a whole lot of, and you'll, you'll like the segue here, is uh, Distant Worlds 2. <laughs> <laughs> so Das Das and I have been playing this for a while. Um, I, I guess I probably, I was trying to do some number crunching in my head. I've probably put in close to 200 hours of Distant Worlds 2. Uh, I'm, I'm just guessing because I have 30 hours on Steam, which is just from the preview. I'm, I'm actually guessing that your hours surpass mine even, Das. But this is a really good game. I've, I'm up to 166 hours in the Steam version. Oh my gosh. Wow. So you're you're well beyond me. Yeah, that's not... Um, that's that's like we've been both on the beta process. So most of what we've been playing has been the, the beta version of the game. It hasn't even been the Steam version. Exactly. Yeah, that's why when I, when I see 30 hours on the preview, I, I'm guessing that I probably have at least 100 hours in the beta. Yeah, I think it, like a lot of the time I've been putting into it, though, has been because I do live streams on the Slytherin channel as well, the publisher of the game. So so in that sense, I, I've actually had it when the other preview versions were no longer available. So I, I did actually have a, a, a few weeks there with the Steam version that nobody else really had. So that would have boosted my numbers a bit. Oh, I see. Well, so we it's funny because all the other games we've been talking about, um, none of I don't think any of them were really 4X, and certainly none of them were space games. So now we have this new ent- entrant to the field, uh, Distant Worlds 2. Uh, das, would you explain it to anybody who would be crazy enough not to have heard of it? It's, it's, yeah, this is actually something I've just been recording a primer uh, for my YouTube channel. I'd like just a one-off video, a single video to try to help new players actually get their head into the game. And it's for me, games like Dwarf Fortress, Distant Worlds, Dominions and those sorts of games are games that when you look at it from the outside, they 
look incredibly complex because of the amount of uh, game mechanics involved. But uh, with all of those games, uh, that I find the most enjoyment you get is when you actually just go along with the flow. And Distant Worlds 2 is definitely a game that I've always considered it like a space opera, even Distant Worlds 1, Distant Worlds Universe. For me, that's a, a, it's a space opera game, essentially, where the story is more important than the strategy. The strategy is there so that you can actually inject and solve problems that come up randomly or procedurally that you then have to solve. And I think it, so it's one of those things where the more you just relax and go along with the story rather than trying to min-max it too much, you end up with a, a much, much more enjoyable process. And the game is incredibly unbalanced and in, in a good way. So it's never, I hope they never make a multiplayer version of the game because it really is something where the game itself will sort of just take a, on a life of its own. And you, if you have a multiplayer game, that would be annoying because you're competing with other people. Whereas with Distant Worlds 2, because it is a story as much as a, simu- a strategy, it's a simulation as well, really, you end up with a, um, with a process where if you just go with the flow and just let things develop, it's really, really fun uh, to actually sort of then just try to sort little things out. For example, even today, I was, I was live streaming it this morning and um, I had a situation where I had a, a very close ally that was sort of like the next uh, empire across from me and we had a, a spice world in between us and there's only one now in the in the game and these are, these are game-changing planets and it started off with in neither of our territory and so I started to see, get everything set up to build mining stations and so on and so forth. But then the other player ended up actually expanding his re, his his borders into that particular system. And so it then became, how do I take that system back off him but not go into war with him? And so it ends up with a whole big plethora of different ways you've then got to try to change the borders <laughs> which was really really fun you know and it was sort of because it's one of those things where you've then got to look at everything else around it so your focus moves away from it just being the stock standard way of always doing something to here's a very specific problem i must have that spice world like it's like arrakis essentially and so to get that you can't really use subterfuge to get it my options ended up being take over other worlds close to the border and let them expand their influence before he has a chance to colonize worlds in that system or declare war against him and uh, and then go and take the system with a colonizing ship so but it was just fun to actually sort of play that one through and it, it was a lot of toing and froing where ended up being bored of sort of switching sides at different times and yeah it was just a real lot of fun i really enjoyed it it was probably one of the most fun times i've had with distant worlds too it's it, like it was just this morning on twitch wow it's distant worlds who does present a lot of these options a lot of scenarios like this one of the best things about it it's just i don't know why it isn't modeled into many other games um did you consider just attacking the station without actually declaring war or did they get once you get the influence in that I'm assuming that they got the influence because they built the station there. Because that's one way you can get your influence on a on a system. I don't know. I don't know if the stations give you much influence. I didn't think they gave you much. I thought it all really came down to the population centers that were the population times the uh, or you know with a a big component being the development of that particular planet so if you've got like a lot of population on a on a colony nearby and high development it will then push the borders out i didn't know that that actual that uh stations actually did that I i thought it was only the actual population centers what i was actually saying is the i thought that once you build a station in a territory that you cannot lose control of it is that not true? Can you like... No, you, you can definitely... Because what actually happened was when he actually claimed it, I actually was... I was in the system. I had sent colonizers to go and colonize the system before he then took over. You can't colonize once somebody else has it. And I cut, I couldn't build... I had also had um, construction ships to go in and build everything, but he took over just before the construction ships got there. And then he went and built everything. I then took over an independent colony, which was fairly close to it. And it was all from the, it was his actual home world that was actually pushing, like as his home world developed and got bigger and bigger, it pushed the borders out and ended up claiming that particular world right on the, right on the, uh, on the border between us. And so I had to take over an independent, which was really close to where the borders were, and then let it develop to push the borders back again. And so that's how I got it. And it was only for a split second that basically uh, it ended up coming back into my sphere. So I quickly contacted 
contact him because he was my ally and basically sort of said, look, I'll buy. He had like about six different um, stations that he'd built in that system. So I bought all of the stations because I now controlled the system. He didn't want to keep them because it would then be co- cause a diplomatic incident. So I then bought all, everything, including the Spice World station. And then it switched again. Like my my the development on, on the world that I took over, actually they, they ran out of some of their luxury resources and so that de- oh my gosh the development went back and in his home world then pushed the border back out and so he then claimed the system again which meant i couldn't colonize inside there and so i couldn't really claim it and so i had a colonizer sitting on the outside ready to colonize it so i then had to uh, uh, luckily by getting the spice world station the spice then went to the planet first that was on the border which then boosted its development which then pushed the borders back out again allowing the borders to then push back against him enough for me to get the colonizer in and then claim that and once you've got the colony in there it can't really go back against you so it was a real toing and froing <laughs> but again it was <laughs> it's a good illustration of the the depth of the mechanics that are available to you in in distant worlds too and that's just that's, that's just purely from a diplomatic perspective you know like there's so much that the game actually has for analysis like that you know like with like if you come up against a, a particular base that's you know like it's really built in a very particular way you need to design your ships to take to take that base out that's what i love about the game and you don't know what that's going to be until you start playing like that that spice world could have been anywhere do you need to design your own ships or can you rely on like auto designing at all wow the automation has just gotten so much better in this one i think Mm, yeah, I agree. So you you don't have to. Because, I you know, one of the criticisms I see of a lot of Space 4X games are, I got this big sprawling empire, but it also wants to be rule the waves and make me, like, design ships in intricate detail. And it's like, I'd rather not do that. And I think one of the things that Distant Worlds 1 did a pretty good job of, and I, I know you've already talked about this a little bit, is allowing you to choose what you're going to interact with and, and do that and not interact with stuff you have no interest in interacting with. But I am curious how good the ship designs are if you decide to kind of not involve yourself in that too much. I would say they're very good, actually. I, th- I think it's one of those games where if you don't, if you're not interested in, in designing your own ships, they will certainly be serviceable. Where I think the nuance comes in, and I, I always think of it in terms of when, the, for example, in the early mid game, you're coming up against pirate bases which are very, very strong, and they will have different sorts of designs on them. And so you'll have some, for example, that will have like a lot of armor with low shielding. You'll have some with the opposite with high shielding, low armor. Uh, some of them will have like uh, lots of, of a fighter a fighter craft that's protecting them they'll have different sort of missiles they could have rail guns all sorts of different different weaponry and so if you just rely you can you can just get like a massive fleet of of ships that the that the ai will design for you and go in and, and that will still win but if you're trying to sort of do it to make the best like again this this game i was playing this morning i um i had exactly this situation where i had a pirate base that i needed to try to kill and so i purpose i purposely built uh, a fleet of ships that should have been able to take it out but the one thing i didn't have on the ships was very effective point defense and this this base actually destroyed my whole fleet before i even got within range of firing one bullet or what, like one one rail gun bullet <laughs> at it because i didn't have point defense on that's what i mean like it's one of those games where and i love that because basically it meant that i had to I got one ship out of there, out of the the whole fleet, and then had to go back and redesign a fleet with with strong point defense. And the way that the game now works, and as I say, like you don't have to do that, but if you do enjoy doing that, the game rewards you for it. And each actual ship now has like a different hard points on it. Like in Distant Worlds 1, it just fired from the middle of the ship in whichever direction it wanted to fire. But now the hard points actually have a range of fire and so if you've got something that is not a seeking type weapon, like if you've got like a rail gun or, um, or something where it's like a direct fire, like a beam weapon, then the, the field of fire is really, really important. And so depending on the faction that you play, every single, like if you have like a frigate, for example, that's a human frigate, most of the, um, the, tar- or the, the hard points sort of face towards the front and out to the broadsides, but not very much in behind. If you're playing, for example, like the Actarians, which are like the the aquatics, they have a more balanced approach where they have sort of like more 360 degree areas, which is great for point defense, but they don't have a real lot of firepower at the front. So you've got to take all that into account. So like, for example, if you've got an extremely aggressive faction like the Boscarans are all front facing, basically, it means if you can get in behind them, they're very, very vulnerable. But 
to get past that front facing turrets is really, really hard. And so it's, it's, there's a lot more nuance now than what there ever was in Distant Worlds Universe or Distant Worlds 1 uh, with the way that the ships actually do work. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's just incredibly different. And, um, and it's really rewarding to, to see how that pirate base defended itself just using fighter craft that I couldn't actually destroy. And they ripped me apart. And then the next time I went in, I went in with, with a, a mix of different ships that actually had very, very strong point defense. And that was what it took to take that particular pirate base down because of what they did to me originally. I hope that you wrote your letter to uh, to the 20,000 uh, space marines who you lost in that initial uh, debacle and let the, let the families know, listen, it was pretty awesome. Uh, we forgot to put point defense on our ships. And I regret to inform you that your son died a glorious death. Well, I did put point defense on, to be fair, but it wasn't effective point defense. And so I, I needed to go back and, and and uh, research more. <laughs> I'd like to bring in a different perspective uh, here because I think that Distant Worlds 2 can still be played like a traditional 4X game. I mean, it has the richness offered by allowing you to do, you can call it a space opera. I've always kind of said it's like a galactic simulator, almost like Sim Ant or like Sim City. Yeah. Well, more, more like Sim Ant where you can just let go and watch the crazy happen and it's, it's very entertaining that way i also think it can be played as a traditional 4x game and you can get into the min max and you can do all those things it, it is actually one of the best things about it is that it's hard for some games to do one thing well and it, it actually does multiple things well it can provide you the dwarf fortress and i, I would actually call it um for those of you who know aurora 4x probably you already know this but it's kind of like the rim world to aurora 4x's Dwarf Fortress. Yeah, that's a that's a really good analogy, Eric. A really, really good one. It is it it is Aurora Four X with uh, with a user interface. Yeah, yeah. I, re- I mean, I wish I could take credit for that, but I've seen that comment somewhere else, and I just latched onto it because I also agree it's it's a very good description of it. But for people who don't know Aurora Four X, you probably at least heard of Dwarf Fortress and how very detail oriented that, and maybe you've heard of a Worm World. And Distant Worlds 2 just allows you to play more like a RimWorld game. And first of all, yes, it does have an interface, but uh, I think it's a lot less involved. You can really take your hands off the keyboard and just watch the gameplay itself. For I mean, if you want to set up the automation that way, you can actually... There's people who, especially like, in, I hope this is okay to say, but like in beta testing, you would just turn your faction, your empire on like full automation and you'd come back like eight hours later to see if the game was running. You know, you just this is, this is like testing, but basically you can actually play the game this way where the, your empire runs itself and in a convincing, like compelling way. It's still entertaining <laughs> to like just watch what your ships are doing. I agree 100%. It's actually, it's in there's very few games you can do that with. I would say there's one other component to this game. I, I kind of alluded to it, this galactic simulator aspect of it is the fact that the universe the gal- the well the galaxy it feels lived in it feels like there's actually those civilian traffic there's these civilians traversing on these they end up making basically lanes traffic lanes going to the most popular colonies or if you need a specific resource the price for that goes up for the civilian market so more miners will start going to mine it and then you'll, you'll see, okay, there's a lot of miners going over to that planet because I'm missing this resource. That is just so compelling to me. I just love that, that there's this depth in the game that it builds it into a living, breathing galaxy. For me, that's how I, I mean, some people may disagree. I know that there's some really, really detail-oriented spreadsheet folks who have gone in and been like, well, this doesn't really make sense. Are they really, how's the economy working here? I, I just buy it because it just feels good. I mean, if people suspend their disbelief for only being three resources in Stellaris, why not? Why not Distant Worlds? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing with Distant Worlds is you you have to have every single resource at the location that you need it to be able to do anything. And so that logistics... But I don't have to transport it, right? Like the civilians will do that for me. Yeah, but they will transport it. It actually has to be transported. Um, It's just, you know, in most games, right, you just have some gold minerals gas whatever on the top and it's just like global no in this game the resources actually have to be transported to the 
construction site, which is amazing. If you try to build a spaceship at a location that doesn't have all the resources it needs to build it, it won't let you build it. It's really interesting. And not that you have to manage that. As Eric was sort of saying, the, the big part of it is you've got these uh, freighters and miners and mining ships and things that you don't control that just go around and actually mine it all. All you can do is say, like you can actually go to a, a colony and say, we are going to need X, Y, or Z. If you do want to micromanage it, you don't have to micromanage it, but it will automatically try to keep like a, a stockpile ready ready for construction of what it thinks that you will need, but you can override that if you do want to. And so that will then mean that more freighters will then go, okay, they need fuel at that location. Let's go and transport it. And um, it's fascinating. As, as Eric was sort of saying, I, I enjoy just actually clicking on individual uh, cargo ships and seeing what they're carrying and where they're going to and what they're doing. And it's sort of, it's really boring in, in the sense that it's you know it's just it's just the logistics of empire but it's it is like watching a, an ant colony just watching you know watching or bees you know watching bees sort of just do what they do and it's uh it's great because you don't have any control over it or you know you can sort of push things along a little bit but you can't tell unless you're playing as a one of the mercantile factions you can't actually then go to a mining ship and say okay you're half full of steel i need steel urgently back at home turn around and come back with what you've got and then we'll send somebody else out to get the rest of it. It's um, it's one of those things, if you don't have control of that mining ship, it's just going to keep on mining away <laughs> while you desperately need a resource back at your home world waiting for this mining ship to return. And it's sort of, you end up watching these ships thinking, I need that ship back home right now because I can't build what I need to um, to sort of go to the next phase of the game. It's uh, It's brilliant the way it does work. And it really is living. It's a living in. It's a living galaxy. There's two things I want to jump into based on what you just said. One, does that make commerce rating a viable war strategy against AI? Is just interdicting their civilian shipping and and bringing their economy to a halt? Absolutely. Yeah. It's one of those things where, in fact, yeah. It's like, you know, sorry, I'm just jumping straight in on top of that one. But that is something like if you are going to. There's so many different ways of hurting another empire. And a big way, like I guess the easiest way is to find like the, the fuel that it uses is, a, is a, a gas called Caslon. Everyone uses that. And there's not that many, they come from gas giants. So you have to then sort of find, okay, where are they getting their fuel from? If you can go and destroy and control their fuel, it'll take a fair while for them to run out of fuel. But if you can do that, you basically stop their empire. And so you can focus on very specific resources, uh, like like fuel is a good one to sort of starve them. So you can actually play that way where you don't even invade their colonies, you just control space, or you can invade their colonies and take them over that way if you're strong enough to do so. Or you can, you know, sort of, um, there's other big planets, like we was talking there about the, uh, the spice planets. There's three different resources that are luxury resources, which really, really impact your uh, development, like it give you a massive boost in the game. One of, one of them is it's a spice. Caribbean spice. You've got like these loris fruits as well, and you've got this Zendavia fluid. And those three resources, if you can control those, it gives you a massive boost in development. And so even just having a war over who gets to control that is is important. So there's so many different ways of looking. It's, it's nuanced, you know, like it's not just a matter of, okay, you've got to invade this colony to take them over. You can actually destroy somebody simply by cutting off their fuel. It's uh, really, really interesting. That's awesome because I think one of the things for me personally is I enjoyed playing Stellaris when it came out with friends. It was a fun, easy to jump into space game. But I think the one thing that really frustrated me was one, resources are just sort of everywhere and, and really the lack of civilian traffic. It just made, it, it to Tortuga's earlier point, it never felt like the galaxy was lived in. Um, but similar to that, because Stellaris does have this whole like arc of, of gameplay where you're going sort of from the early game to the end game, and there is an end game phase to that. I have not gotten far enough into Distant Worlds 2. Is this just pure sandbox, or is there a narrative? Is there an end game that's going to, to come at some point? Like, what's other than building your empire in this giant galactic sandbox? Is, is, there, a, is there an arc to the gameplay here? I haven't found one specifically. I've gotten to a point where you end up with like planet destroyer ships and things like that. And that sort of feels like the end of the game because at that point, nobody can really challenge you. Um, there are also certain things that are left over 
uh, from the like the the previous sort of galactic war. Like there's these hive ships which are incredibly powerful, which are sort of like the uh, like a remnant from previous battles, you know, from eons before. And so when you do find them, they do feel like a bit of a, a final invasion. I haven't really come across anything specific. Have you, Eric? Have you actually got to a point where this, where you feel like this is like the end game? No, I don't think so. Uh, I also, well, the the problem with being in the beta is that you always have these new. Um, they'd always be saying, "Okay, please switch to this new version and start testing that." And I, I kind of fell in line for that. So I, I don't think I ever got to. I didn't ever got to the end game. In fact, one of the things I was curious about, which I was going to ask you about even is what does it mean that you can win the game by these story events i'd be curious to see what that looks like because i've in fact i've never even played distant worlds with any of the victory conditions checked in distant worlds one i i think i unchecked them all just to make sure it was a sandbox yeah i'm the same actually and I'll, i will be doing exactly that after the launch basically i'll be going and turning off the race specific story events <laughs> <laughs> for, for that exact reason, I prefer to have the the randomization without having like a any sort of uh, direction that you're heading. But I know that, for example, the Mortalins are the one that can get the uh, the planet destroyer ship, and that is essentially the end of the game. For, like if you're if you're the Mortalin player and get hold of that ship, then uh, you you basically can't really lose from that point. Sorry, to jump in, but have you um, had to fight a planet destroyer ship? Have you actually had to take out one? from the opponent because that sounds fun i haven't um i've what i've been what i ended up doing because it wasn't balanced when i when i found i found one and and ended up getting it and it was like it was a one-shot kill against any other ship in the game like including the hive ships uh if you if you if you had the 20 seconds to turn the thing around and fire at a hive ship that was it The, the hive ship was completely destroyed and so it was sort of ended up being not that much fun and it but at that stage the game wasn't balanced and so after that, what I used to do was start up a game because I still knew that they were in the game. I'd start the game up, turn on the editor and very quickly look and scan for where they were and just delete them out of the game. <laughs> so so I never really, uh, like, I think they're still in the game, but I, I don't know where they are or what they're like anymore. But they used to be extremely strong. So they're just things you can find, you can't build them? Uh, no, you find them basically. There's, there's, I think there's only one. So as the Mortalin player, I don't think anyone else can actually get it other than the Mortalins. Uh, I think that if you aren't the Mortalins and try to take it over, you get tech, but that's about all, I think. I think it's only the Mortalin player that can actually go and grab that. Okay. The, the, the other thing I know they've been sort of really promoting is is the modability of this. So it'll be really interesting to see. I mean, the galaxies in this game are huge. And the complexity is huge as well, so I'm I'm excited to see what modders end up doing with this too. Yeah, well, that'll that's also something at the moment uh, when it actually does launch, it won't be fully mod ready. Um, you'll be able to do little replacement type mods where you replace you know core files, but uh, because they had so much that they were balancing towards the end, they never really had a chance to implement a, a full mod system. And I know that they're going to be looking at that. So I would say within the next few months, we'll sort of see something that's going to be you know, quite special. And, and I, I agree. I think the mods are going to be amazing for this game. I do also want to call out that like, I know we're talking about how complex and deep this game is, but when I open it up and I just start playing it, well, the UI, it, it doesn't feel overwhelming. And I feel like Distant Worlds 1 could at times, right? There was a ton of information presented in kind of an older format of UI design. I open this up and, and like if I start clicking multiple layers down, like, yeah, I can get really deep into a whole bunch of information. But when you first jump in and you just kind of start playing around, like it, it doesn't feel that overwhelming. It doesn't feel that much different than something like Stellaris, which is certainly an an easier game to get into, I think. So I do think they've done a good job of balancing, from what I've seen anyway, the complexity that exists under the hood and is accessible to you uh, against complexity that you don't necessarily have to interact with. Yeah, I would say that it's just Distant Worlds, the original, was special. And the thing which makes Distant Worlds 2 special, considering it is a sequel, which follows almost all the same gameplay mechanics from the first one, is that it's it's been completely polished in the area it was most lacking. Uh, okay, I don't want to say completely polished, but it has been overhauled and much improved in the areas of user interface and relaying information to the user. These have been greatly improved. 
No, I agree 100%. That alone is worth worth getting the game, to be honest, because it, it's not overwhelming now. It's um, And uh, Matt, you know, with the way you described it, I think was, was was perfect. It really is, you know, it's one of those things where the interface no longer, you're no longer fighting with the interface. The interface is there to help you. And um, and it, it, it introduces concepts to you slowly over time, which is instead of it being a, a spreadsheet, which is what Distant Worlds Universe was, uh, you know, you are playing with something now where the spreadsheets are still there, but they're not they're not everywhere if you know what I mean so no, I think it's um, I, I find that that alone is is um, I could never go back to Distant Worlds Universe just from that one aspect but there's other other nuances of course that have come into the game as well that's interesting you say that because that's exactly what Tortuga has said in the past like he's talked to a bunch of people who played Distant Worlds Universe and a lot of them have all said the same thing where they say you know I could never go back to to Distant Worlds Universe after playing Distant Worlds 2 but if only they would allow me to queue orders. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my. So I've been gushing about this game, but I want to be. I want to try to be fair and be um, critical. I first of all want to gush about it one more time, just to say that it's basically a two-man team: Eric Rudens and Elliot Gibbs, who have. They're competing. In my opinion, this game is better than Stellaris. They're competing with the the likes of the Stellaris. They're competing with the likes of. All these other 4X games like Gal Civ and all those. And I feel like they just knock it out of the park. But I also want to try to be fair and have some kind of criticism of the game. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, actually, because there are some negatives about the game. Maybe you can lead off then. Oh, look, you're a much more critical person than I am. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I'll, I will say the one thing that I uh, I don't like... Okay, so one thing I don't like is the, the focus of the game has actually shifted slightly, and I think it's in order to appeal to the broader public, and it's, it's almost like a Hearts Fire and 3 to Hearts Fire and 4 type focus switch, so a lot of people will be very happy with it. But the focus of the game has clearly gone away from manual control and to automated. The game is like, I think it's actually geared to play a lot of these things automated. So Matt, you asked earlier, like, ship design i i actually feel like ship design is one of those things where a lot of people are still going to do it but that the game is actually geared for people not to have to do it and this is a in my opinion it's a reversal and i'm not i would say it's not a welcome reversal the game plays great on automated and i use automated systems now but i still miss the ability to do everything manually Whereas now it's a bit of a burden to do those things. It, it, it almost feels like I should be playing on automated. And that's something I don't like. So I like that. I, I actually I find that a big, big positive because what it then means, if you've got a really competent AI that can design ships as, a, as, the, as the one example that we're sort of using here, it means that the AI that you're playing against will have the same benefits of really, really well-designed ships. So for me, that's sort of not a problem at all. I think the only aspect about that I would never want to be playing fully manual because of the um, the taxation rates on, on individual colonies, trying to sort of keep them op- optimised. That would be a nightmare going back every you know every couple of weeks and in gameplay to, to go and tweak um, a taxation setting. So I would never want to have turn those off. But I, I really like the feel of it. Let me just jump in real fast. Just to, I want to clarify, my I'm, I mean, it's not that I don't like the automated. I actually agree with you completely that the new automated stuff is great and I do find myself using it. The thing I miss is it now feels like it's harder to play manual than it is than it used to be in Distant Worlds 1. That they've actually made some decisions where they they have not catered to the manual player. So automated is great and I, I agree that the AI is going to be competitive with you because automation is so good and that's what the AI is going to use. But for the person who wants to do the min-max type stuff, they're actually going to find their, that it's like you're playing with one hand behind your back. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't still I still don't subscribe to that, to be honest. I, I think that you can turn, because you've got so much control over all the automation settings, that you can pick the sweet spot. You know, like if you if you are wanting to play uh, manual, like you can switch everything off if you're wanting to. But it's as you say, it's not going to be it's not going to be pleasant to do it. But you can then just turn on back on those things where you don't want to be focusing. So I don't know. For me, it's actually it covers both both aspects. So I think really quite nicely. So I do disagree with you there, Eric. Okay, that's fine. We can we can. I'm I'm happy to agree to disagree. Like one of the things, for example, is the the budget management you talked about. Um, so I would love for there to be even like a little bit more steps more automation options available to you like how to toggle just parts of it on the one thing i want to do is i want to set that stupid cash back 10 percent thing down to zero and then automate the rest of it uh, but i can't do that so in order to not have this real inefficiency that 10 percent of my budget is not going towards colonization and research um, i have to play with that 
turned off. I have to play it with it on manual. Otherwise, since 10% of your budget doesn't go to your, I mean, it goes to your cash, you can't use that to feed, I mean, you can use it to feed your research in the sense that you can crash research on top of that, but it's just a reduction of your, your research labs. That's a really good point, actually. Uh, like those, some of those um, areas um, would be great if you could have the overall uh, split uh, automated where it sort of figures out where to sort of shuffle everything around. But the overriding numbers you have control over. That's actually, I will, I will uh, reverse my, uh, my descent. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, for that particular item. And the other one is for me, this, uh, I know, I, I'm not actually, I'm not sure. And I would actually love to interview Elliot or Eric if he knows the mind of Elliot. Uh, about this decision on order queues, because it, it is, it really, I, I maybe I'm just alone. And I want to say that at least when I mentioned this on um, the beta forum, which is under NDA, so I'm not going to say much about this, but I will say this um, because I think it actually defends the game's viewpoint. So to their benefit, let me just say that there were a lot of people who said, no, I don't really need to play with order queues. Yeah, I no, I agree with you. I think that they should they should, I think they should be there. I've had so many instances where I've um, I've been wanting to queue things up and I haven't been able to. And I also, with that as well, I think there's also instances where you want a ship to, I wish the default was to stay at automated. And so if you go and click on something for a ship to go and divert and do something that you don't have to then go back and manually set it back to automated, automated again, I think the default should be keep it automated, but I would love to have queues in there. Yeah, and, and it's really just right now, I think it's my opinion that the, the focus is supposed to be moving everything towards automation so that the AI does it just as well. And I understand the rationale there, but I don't like the fact that doing things manually now is more painful. I don't know exactly what the motivation is not to have order queues. Obviously, if you have order queues, there's no penalty to, I, I don't know what the downside of it is other than the development cost to put it in the game. Basically, I, I'm not sure I agree with the game design decision. If it's a simply a game design decision and not a development resource limit that they have chosen not to put those in, then yeah, I, I don't understand it. And well, I should say, there might be a good reason that an interview would reveal, but I have thought about it a lot in my in the you know many minutes of frustration when I'm trying to manually keep track of all these explorers and you have them idling and doing nothing for like five minutes because you missed one. And in all those minutes, I've been trying to think, is there an angle I'm missing? And I can't see it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel like order cues feels like the kind of thing you would want to include. Um, I can see a lot of the rationale behind some of the decisions they made. Uh, and I think there is a place in the Forex space for a game that is polished and that is big and that is complex, but that's also approachable. And I think Distant Worlds 2 can be that. But I'm not sure I understand how having order queues would hinder that. If anything, I would think it would support that, right? Like, I can see some of the changes they made from Distant Worlds Universe to Distant Worlds 2. And I can say, like, okay, they're definitely trying to trying to appeal to a wider audience while staying core to the, the I think, what makes Distant Worlds special. And I think they did a really good job in that. But what that is a little bit confusing or baffling on why you wouldn't have order queues because I don't think that serves the simplification. If anything, it probably makes it harder to play. Yeah, I, no, I think I think it's. I, I agree with both of you. I think it's something that should be in the game, but um, unfortunately, it's not at this stage. And things may change. Maybe it will be right. Like it's this is just launching, so you know who knows what what's uh, in the in the pipeline, or maybe you do but can't say what's in the pipeline for post for post launch. Like the one that I, I, a lot of people comment on is the lack of uh, planets that, that orbit each other. Um, they find that really off-putting because they're used to it in Distant Worlds Universe. Like the, the planets in there are sort of stuck in their positions and they don't move at all. Uh, that's something that doesn't bother me much, but it is a, I, I know that for a lot of players, that's a big, big negative uh, because they, they used to love the aesthetics of the planets actually in orbit. Uh, you know, moons around planets and planets around su sun systems was, um, and it was cool, but it's just, you know, they, I can understand why they didn't do that. But the other big one is the uh, is the lack of, um, of the actual factions, the playable factions. Actions. I, I felt that that's there's only a couple of them right there's seven so you start with seven which which is actually more than most other games will actually have but when you consider the distant worlds universe had close to 20 i think it was like it, you know or even more maybe i can't remember how many it actually had but um 
they're in the game. They're just not playable, and they will be playable. But you know, that's that's going to be coming in the future. They just, I guess that now it's so much more complicated to actually build a faction than what it was previously because of the 3D aspects, and um, and so that's that that is going to be a it's going to be a lot of development put into every single faction now. Whereas, you know, back in the distant worlds universe days, you were just using sprites, and so I guess the the cost to build a faction now just in development time is is much much higher. So. Hence the seven factions, but that I think is going to be a stumbling block for a lot of players. Do you think we'll end up seeing a faction creator at some point where you can like create your own traits for a given faction, even if it's just the one you play as? I don't. It's a good question, actually. It's it, it's interesting thinking about that. It's um, because you'll have all these different ship ship sets that you can sort of bring in. Like the ship classes don't change between factions. The um, the actual traits that you actually then have on them also don't change between factions it's just the the balance of how they sort of then work out that's a really really interesting question because by the time the game does actually let's just say by the time we've got like you know 15 or 20 little factions that are actually part of the game then that's all going to be completely unique ship sets and it would just be a matter of of saying okay look i want to use the human ship set with these particular traits i think that would be really really interesting i haven't even thought of that like as a as a possibility i think it's a great question yeah, I would love to see that. I mean, again, I, I, I'm i not a big Space 4X person. I know there's a lot of games out there. The one I play the most is Stellaris. But, like, you can edit your own faction's traits. So it would be interesting if you could create your own faction in Distant Worlds. I think that would add a lot of people's ability to sort of create the world and universe that they want to live in if they could edit their own factions. Yeah, that's really interesting. Really interesting thought. I, I've always wanted to have the Galsiv type empire creator in this one or even like stellaris does it well but if anything for the team it's probably a big stretch goal we'll see i mean i actually think this game is going to be really successful both critically and like financially for slytherin and matrix because i just i feel like it it does compete with stellaris with like a lot less of the development resources being put into it so i hope so i you know i think one of the things that's going to be important is they've got to market the game and, and, you know, they know their audiences, they know their, their products. And I understand why some of the games, they don't push a ton, but like the space four X genre is a, is a, is a very large audience, but I don't know how many of them know about Slytherin. And, you know, obviously all of us have played distant worlds and then a lot of different Slytherin products, but they're going to have to make sure that this gets outside of their normal bubble, I think. And and it will to some extent via osmosis, via channels like ours getting some stuff out there, but I hope they're gonna invest some additional resources uh beyond what you know you typically see to try and branch out to uh to folks who might not see it otherwise. Yeah, I think it's a good 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 point. And I, I think what they'll do is they'll end up with a lots of opportunities in the future as they bring out new either DLCs or updates. In one sense they like it's no, it's not a niche game. It like it is. It's not one of this the standard Matrix uh, war games. You know, like where there is a, a very niche audience that does play it. This is really is mainstream. This is very broad in its approach. And um, I think that they've the thing that really I'm heartened about by that is the price that they've put on it. I think that's a realistic price for a game that's mainstream. And so for me, like I was worried about whether the price would be too high because of that niche aspect to it so i feel that they're they're on on point with that and also when i was watching the slytherin tea time stream uh last week they were mentioning that this is you know been they've been blown away by just the popularity in the pre-orders that have actually come through and the wish lists um this has been by far their biggest wish list game so they have been pushing things in a in a in a very steam oriented way i think so i think that they'll do a really really good job of the marketing of this so i think that you know the fact that they've priced it so that it's more mainstream is for me a, a just from my own um uh, sort of peace of mind about like because distant worlds one was a, a game that should have been mainstream but it was niche because of the pricing whereas this game the pricing is great in my opinion. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, so I, I wonder, obviously, I, I, I'm not inside the uh, inside the ballpark, if you will. But, you know, when Slytherin used to have a pretty firm stance about going to Steam with their games, when they eventually decided to go to Steam, I know one of the first, there were two games that stood out that they initially went to Steam with. One of them being Command Modern Operations and the other being Distant Worlds Universe. 
And I remember when those two games hit Steam, it was really interesting because I think Command stayed in the top 20 Steam sale, sell, sales for like a month, a month and a half. And Distant Worlds was like number six at one point for a while. And then it was shortly after those games went on Steam. And I, I, I can't remember which went first. I think those games probably were more successful than they anticipated when they went to Steam. And uh, they've really been on Steam ever since. Yeah, I think you're right. The At that stage, uh, I remember when Distant Worlds went across to Steam because people were urging them, please put it on Steam, please put it on Steam. But the pricing was still niche pricing. So even when it went to Steam, it, it, there was no... It was, it, it was still very expensive to get into Distant Worlds. And so even though people were really interested in it, um, and it, I think it did a lot, lot better than what people anticipated on Steam, like, you know, particularly because it was sort of like the entry into using Steam. I think after they did that... It, it was also like six or seven years old at the time, too. It wasn't like it was a new game, right? Exactly, yeah. So it, it, I think it blew them away that uh, you know, basically how they could leverage um, you know, these, these games like this. And so, yeah, I think that... I don't know. I think they've done Distant Worlds too. The the pricing and all that. I think they've done it really, really well. Yeah, I guess my main my main concern or hope is that. Don't get me wrong. I like getting keys. <laughs> I like getting access. But I do hope that they they are they're using their marketing department to get this out in front of people who are not their normal clientele. Because I think there is a a tendency in companies to pitch to the pitch to what you know and if you have a gem like this you know you got to step outside your comfort zone sometimes to make sure that it it gets to its audience because this is a mainstream game like this can be very successful i think in a wide branch of folks who would not normally look to buy slytherin games and you know for for the developer's sake i hope it is because everything i've seen everything i've played everything i've seen you guys create um, this is a special game and I'm excited about it. I, I think there definitely are some shortcomings or some things that can get polished or ironed out over time, but this is, you know, this is the direction that I think you want to see, see these types of games go. And I think it really is, I, th- I it can really occupy a special place in the genre of being both deep and complex, like a game, like Aurora, while being approachable and pretty, like something like Stellaris. Yeah. Yeah, that's right on. Was that, does that conclude the topic? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't mean, I wasn't trying to go there, but is there anything we didn't talk about that you guys want to bring up? The only thing I would mention is maybe just to, to nod my head towards the development team. I think that Eric Rudens is really something special at Matrix. Um, he listens to people well. Um, he takes ideas he just removes his ego so completely from the equation uh, and, and just analyzes your point and very compassionate. It's incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible, isn't it, that what he does because um, he's – how does he keep on being so polite? And, and when people are sort of like – you know, they put years and years of effort into this thing and people are saying, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. And it must it must weigh you down. It must weigh you down. And um, But he's, he's always, always polite. So there's one story uh, – for the, when the preview came out, people were talking about the user interfaces and good and all that. And um, instead of just getting very upset, I mean, he probably in private, maybe he got upset, but Eric just put together this very elaborate set of pictures comparing what Distant Worlds 1 was and Distant Worlds 2. Just because you imagine, they, you've noticed it, Matt, how redone the user interface is. Can you imagine how they must have felt when people were like, oh, it just looks like the original one? It must have been just crushing. No way. I don't know how you could say that. Like literally opening this up. I'm like, oh, this looks like something that like modern paradox could could do. Yeah, there's probably a few extra windows or a few extra click downs that wouldn't exist. But like this looks polished. This looks modern. This looks like something that I would expect, you know, a company that puts millions of dollars into their games. And I, I mean, I don't know what Matrix put in, but, you know, it certainly looks like something like a much bigger company could have made. Um. One one other piece I would say, Tortuga, like good call out to Eric and, and to the folks at Matrix. Can you give a call out to the developer? Yeah. Well, yeah, I was I was getting there. But um, honestly, Elliot, he's a little more removed from the from the situation. The front man, the public face for everything, um, as far as I know, is Eric Rudens. And I don't even think does Elliot has Elliot even done an interview? Yeah, Elliot, I think they're doing one today, actually. 
Well, I'm not saying an interview, but like that's that's a publisher's job is to be the public face. I still want to make sure we recognize the developer, though. Yeah, they, look, both of them are, are very involved, um, and I would sort of say that um, Elliot really is focused on on the development of the game, and so he doesn't like Eric. Sort of runs um, uh, sort of like shotgun for him, basically, just so that he doesn't he can stay focused. And so Elliot really is the is the final arbiter of what gets into the game and what doesn't get into the game, and Eric is sort of like more sort of working the periphery, if that makes sense. So, uh, and they they do like at the, right. At the, I think it's either yesterday or today they're going to be doing like a special um, question and answer, both of them on uh, on what is it Reddit, I think. And so they are both going to be involved in some of the discussions, but um, I don't think that Elliot likes to sort of be front and centre. So in that sense, like, you know, Eric really is the face. Eric is the producer, um, you know, whereas Elliot is the actual developer. And uh, I think that the, the, the relationship that they have, you know, this, this professional relationship is just something so, so special. When you also consider the time differences between them as well, like it's... Um, you know, they're they're on the opposite side of the planet, basically, which is uh, pretty special as well. Uh, by the way, so Code Force is, is Elliot's company. That's right. right yeah, um, and they're the developers of Distant Worlds and Distant Worlds Two. Slytherin slash Matrix uh, is the publisher for this. The Slytherin Group, if you will, that's what you'll find when you go to Steam. Um, and Eric is, as you said, the uh, the producer of that's right this game i believe he was also the ceo of matrix before they were acquired by uh by slytherin um oh, he still is he still is the ceo of matrix um but matrix uh, used to be its own independent company now they're part of now they're part of slytherin are uh, they still in the, they're still sort of independent like they are their own entity as such with eric in charge but they they now share a lot of the administrative load so they have their individual forums of course um you know, Eric's still involved in the day-to-day running of all of those sorts of things as well. So Eric's not just involved in Distant Worlds 2. He's involved in a lot of other other things that Matrix gets involved in. I know he was very involved in, like, um, Decisive Campaigns, Ardennes, I believe, and then also definitely War in the East, too. Yeah, yeah. No, it's... it's um, but I think that, like, at the moment, like, I, I, again, I, Eric just blows my mind to say how much he is um, on top of everything <laughs> with so much going on. It uh, must be very, very difficult for him. And, and similarly with Elliot as well. Like Elliot's, you can sort of see with um, when Elliot is communicating in, in the beta forum, he's very, very focused on uh, on the specific task that he's then trying to sort of target. And I don't know about you, uh, you Eric, but I, 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 I know we're not supposed to talk about the beta process, but I've found the, the first of all, the beta process because of the way that Eric has actually sort of run it, like Eric Rittens has sort of run it, has just been phenomenal. I've, I've, I've been involved in other beta processes where they know we're near as clean as this one. And also, I think that what uh, what Elliot has been able to sort of do through this process, he's been able to really dramatically change the game just so much with almost each iteration that came out as well. And they would come out almost on a weekly basis, you know, like it was... It was incredible to to watch it in just you know, unfold, you know, like over the over the previous few months. Yeah, they're they're a matched pair. I, I mean, I I don't even know them. Like, I don't have any. I don't, I've never talked to Elliot. I've never even. I'm not even sure if I've ever seen them directly communicate to each other. I've only seen Eric Rudin say something like, "Let me talk to Elliot about this." But there's something about. I mean, it's just something which is intangible. But so obvious that their relationship is is that they're a matched pair, that they are working like a well oiled machine, and and you, we can say that Eric Rudens is the producer and Elliot is, but this is their game. I mean, it's Elliot's coding, but Eric is just he's obviously helped the process so much that they're like inseparable. Yeah, you know what it reminds me of is the relationship that, for example, Brad Wardell from Stardock has with Derek Paxton. Like Kale, you know the old modder who came across. I say old, but I mean it's an old mod that he was working on. That who then he was sort of headhunted into into Stardock, and they like they're still the main development team for um, Galactic Civilizations Four, for example. So, and like it, it reminds me very much when you sort of find these very special working relationships. You know, like it's really quite rare. But that's that's the only other one I can really sort of think of where I think, oh yeah, that's 
similar sort of relationship that they actually have there. Tortuga, you you read uh, Sid Meier's memoir, like where he's talking about the different folks he's working on different games with at the time and he's designing Civ and yeah wasn't it Brian it was his guy yeah I forget I forget his last name but yeah I mean it, it sounds like kind of that sort of symbiotic relationship where like Sid's kind of like head down into coding and like yeah obviously he's m- managing design as well but then you know his other folks are, are are definitely very important in the whole process especially in the early days of uh of either microprose or, or fair access Speaking of betas, though, if you guys are interested in uh, uh, participating in betas for uh, Matrix in the future, if you go to matrixgames.com, you go under the community section, there's a beta test section where you can sign up and join betas. Um, I believe you have to be selected, but in any event, like there's different games that are going through betas. Um, looks like Distant Worlds 2 is still up there. I don't know if they're still accepting anyone since they launch, and well, both this podcast will come out after they launch. Uh, but uh, Nuclear War Simulator is one that is uh, on my radar. Uh, Nuclear War Simulator is a detailed, realistic simulation and visualization of large-scale nuclear conflict with a focus on humanitarian consequences. I think I can say that humanitarian consequences would be bad, but it looks pretty cool. Well, I'm not sure I have anything else to say about Distant Worlds 2. I mean, you two are the experts. Uh, Either one of you, Tortuga, maybe you want to wrap up on and kind of sum up distant worlds to you know if you have an elevator pitch on why someone should give this game a look uh you're you're stuck in the in the elevator with with someone you want uh, someone you know who games but maybe they don't play these kind of games or maybe they don't know a lot about slytherin like how are you going to pitch them distant worlds to uh i would do my best by saying it's a space forex game with a soul which means you can get into the game you can be immersed in it and you can like find it as a believable fictional universe. Just it's a game where you can sit and watch the game elements playing and be and just admire any particular place. You can forget that you're playing the game and just start looking at something that's happening in the game because the whole system, the closed system functions so well together. It's like watching a dance play out. I think that pretty much sums it up. I thought that was actually really, really nice. It, it, it is a, a galaxy with a soul, and it's a galaxy with a soul where pretty much not anything can happen, but you don't know what's going to happen when you get into it. Like, it's it's a game that... Like, for example, if you get into Stellaris, and I know there's going to be a lot of, of Stellaris players that will look at distant worlds and saying, where do they both fit together? And I think it's important to sort of differentiate where they actually do fall. Stellaris plays almost the same way each time like it, it, there's not a real lot of of difference or nuance to the problems it presents if you know what i mean like that's that's been my experience you sort of you play a certain way and it just presents itself that way whereas um, distant worlds 2 you could end up with neighbors that are extremely friendly and you and and in that case you have an extremely easy game or you can have neighbors that are extremely aggressive and you just don't you won't know until you actually come across them what you what you're going to experience so for me there's because the the game itself is also playing itself away from what you can see. Like you're only playing maybe sort of like 5% of the actual galaxy itself for most of the game. And uh, the whole rest of the galaxy is is all doing its own thing as well. So it's all happening. Um, and it's not just, it's not abstracting it and then bringing it in when you when you hit a certain level. It's actually playing from the, from the very first moment that you start the galaxy it's working away behind the scenes that you don't get to see until you come across it. So who knows what they're going to find? Who knows what they're going to be presenting? I just find the um, the, the the unbalance of the game just so engaging. Anyway, that's probably really the, where I'd be uh, putting it. But it's you know it's a story simulation more than a strategy game. But it certainly has very very engaging strategic elements. Well, uh, I want to thank you, uh, obviously Tortuga, for coming on again, uh, and uh, Das for for being our guest here today to talk about distant worlds too. Uh, I was looking back and uh, I hope we do a succession series for distant worlds too, because I, I was looking back and I, I know, you know, I think we originally met like eight years ago uh, in a succession series you did with Larry Monty. Uh, but at the time, according to my description on here, your channel was DAS two, four, six, eight, zero. So maybe not as good branding. <laughs> That's right. And actually, it's funny you say that. When we were going to stop, I was going to ask you if you wanted to do that again, because 
I had found all the old notes from that succession game, and um, and I've I'd spoken to Zortuga a couple of days ago about it, and I was thinking, oh, I'll, like, when when we're going to have this thing, I think, okay, afterwards I'll look, I'll ask if you wanted to be involved in that. So I'm going to run it a bit differently than what I did last time, but yeah, I, if you if you're interested, that'd be great. I would definitely be interested in doing that again. That was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I I think. It inspired Tortuga and myself and a couple others. We did a couple of Rule the Waves succession series. And I know, I think when we originally discussed doing that, I think it was definitely directly inspired by, um, at least in my case, uh, the, the Distant World series that, that you ran. So I would I would certainly be interested in doing that again. Some of the memories of that were just so much fun because we would have people from all perspectives of the game people who didn't know how to play the game were playing it and that was so much fun i've got to say i really really enjoyed that oh that was me that was me that was the first time i had ever played distant worlds (laughs) well you weren't alone (laughs) i relied heavily on like the you don't have to micromanage and just you know just be the king or the emperor and let time pass and and kind of manage the big stuff because i didn't know what i was doing tortuga were you in on that no, no. I, I don't think I had met you by then. I, I didn't know about uh, that whole series. I, in fact, I've never seen it. No, I th- I, at that stage, I didn't know you. Um, and there was, uh, there was a lot of players that I hadn't really met before. And I think that, like with the historical game, I think that was our first uh, foray into anything together. And um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, YouTubers that, that no longer do YouTube were part of that as well. So... Um, so I think it's like for us, it's a bit of a start again. I do, I do want to jump back in real quick, Das. So for folks who don't, uh, who don't follow you, where can they find your work? Oh, okay. Look, yeah, it's, um, definitely like youtube.com slash Daz tactic is mainly where I actually, uh, live, uh, for my videos and twitch.tv slash Daz tactic for streaming content. Just wanted to thank you for having me on the podcast. It's been really good fun. It's been um, yeah, really interesting. I, I love doing these sorts of talks with, um, you know, or actually sort of this sort of communication because I've been writing down a few little notes of things to uh, to look out for based on what you guys have been talking about. And I, I do get a lot out of this. So thank you very, very much for inviting me on. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. I would say it's also been very fun for, for me, so... Hey, Dass, you and I are kind of doing this whole thing a lot. We've been <laughs> bumping each other in quite a few podcasts. Well, I appreciate you you coming on and talking to me. If even if you guys are hanging out all the time, it's been it's been a while since we've chatted, Dass, and I've enjoyed uh, having you on. And I look forward to that uh, succession series and see seeing you know what chaos uh, uh, I help to uh, infuse into uh, into a I'm sure a peaceful empire that I'll uh, that I'll inherit from either Tortuga or. Uh, or das and uh, i think we'll wrap it up here so until next time uh thank you all for tuning in to yet another episode of the single malt strategy podcast this was episode number 72 looking at distant worlds 2 for my co-host tortuga power and myself the historical gamer thanks again for coming out and until next time we're out